Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. I want to introduce you today, Pastor David Edmondson. Listen. We have Pastor Todd Smith that is a um, recovering CFC Ministries, Kingdom Ready Ministries. Pastor David Edison is part of our covering as well. And what they have is flowing down from that leadership, from that caliber of leadership is flowing down to this little city, to this town. We get to benefit from it. And there's going to be people that look at this body and say, what they have is flowing down to us. So we need to be responsible to carry that fresh oil, that fresh fire, that it flows down to the ones that are down there that, that, that are looking up to us. They don't even see these guys that we're seeing, but they're looking up to us and saying, Life of Love Church, they're why we're here. They're why we're in this position today. And what they have flows down to us. Let's continue to burn for Jesus. Continue to renew the oil, renew the fire in your lives. So, Pastor David, I want to give you as much time as we can, so come up and, and uh, listen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God is good. Thank the Lord. It's great to be here. Life of Love Church in Martinsville, Indiana. My first time here. Uh, first time in Martinsville. Uh, I guess the Lord is stretching me a little bit. Last week I was in upstate New York and uh, had never been there before. And uh, I'm finding out that God's people are everywhere. Amen. That there's a group that, that loves Him. They're everywhere. And uh, thank God we've got a God that loves us as well. Amen. He loves us. Shout, He loves me. Amen, amen, amen. God is so good. I want you to look in your Bibles, Luke chapter 22. I want to be brief this morning. Uh, pastor's goal is to have us out at 1230, so i got about 35 minutes or so. And uh, so I want to respect that. Um, God is good. He's wonderful. I thank Him for His presence. Pastor Marty made a joke yesterday uh, to the men. Uh, now, Pastor Marty's one of the funniest people on the earth. Uh, he's my wife's cousin. Uh, you know, they're first cousins. So we've, we're not only, I think he mentioned that yesterday, we're not only family in the spirit. Pastor Todd Smith, both of our spiritual fathers. So we're family in the spirit. We're family in the natural. And we've always been, uh, except for that little time period where, <laughs> where we went through, we've always honestly been real close. And uh, he's one of the funniest dudes in the world. But he told a joke yesterday that I thought, yeah, that wasn't real good. You know, <laughs> it's, it's one, of those <clears throat> one of those father jokes. You remember it was about Peter's ear, you men. And uh, how he said he played by ear, you know. Uh, well, when he when he said that, you don't have to laugh just out of mercy. I mean, it was bad. Uh, but when he said that, it, it provoked a thought in my mind of something that the Lord had showed me uh, that I want to share with you today out of Luke chapter 22. Starting in verse 47, this is when Jesus and a few of his disciples were in the garden. He was praying. He was about to go into what the Bible calls his passion. And that was the time where he would uh, go and be tried, put on trial, be convicted uh, as an innocent man, crucified under corporate punishment, placed in a tomb, his spirit we know, descended into Shiloh, took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, set those that were there captive, set them free, and uh, on the third day rose again, thank God. And uh, this is about to happen. He's in prayer and in agony, and he submits his will to God's will. And then all of a sudden, in verse 47, it says, While he yet spake, talking about Jesus, behold a multitude, 
And he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them. And he drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, <clears throat> do you portray the Son of God or the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite with a sword? I want to stop there and just point out what's going on. So we know Judas is betraying him. Judas already made a deal for 30 pieces of silver for the life of, of Christ. He's bringing it to him. And uh, they. what I think is funny in one of the other writings, uh, one of the other apostles' writings, uh, it says that they brought up to 6,000. If you study this out, they brought up to 6,000 men to get Jesus. This was the company to get Jesus. And one writing said that when, when Je they asked of Jesus, they said, we're here to get Jesus. And the Bible says, Jesus said, I am he. If you go read Matthew and Mark, it says that they, they were thrown backwards. At the voice of Jesus, 6,000 soldiers were blown to the ground. Isn't that powerful? Just in the breath of God. Why do I point that out? Because the same Spirit of Christ that was in Jesus is on the inside of you. Somebody say amen. So you got to understand when the Bible says death and life are in the power of your tongue, then literally you have the ability that when you understand who you are, Jesus said, I am He. Is that right? He said, I am he, and at the knowledge of knowing who he was, his spirit knocked back 6,000 of the strongest Roman soldiers. So when you know who you are, and you know the breath of who is on the inside of you, death and life are in the power of your tongue, that you can, one can, can chase how much? A thousand to flight. So just with your one voice, knowing who you are and knowing the Spirit of God is on the inside of you, you can chase a thousand demons to flight. And then when you get the power of agreement, two of you chase 10,000. I love that because God's not a God of, of addition. In the way we count, one would chase a thousand, two would chase 2,000. But God's a God of multiplication. He's a God that always does more than enough. Somebody say amen. amen. God's math doesn't add up to our math. We count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. God counts 10, 9, 8, 7. Why? Because God's already gone to our end and started back to our beginning. That's why God's not afraid of your tomorrow. He's already been there and set you up I wish I had somebody. He's already been to your tomorrow and made a way of escape. Are you here? I'm trying to let you know that with God you cannot fail. Is that right? They come to Jesus and the multitude came up to 6,000 troops. Here comes Judas stepping out, going to betray Jesus with a kiss. Jesus stopped him. And he said, bro, you really going to pretend like you love me in front of the people? When your heart is far from me, that's a message we got to get to the body of Christ because we act like, don't, don't shout me down while I'm preaching good. We act like we love each other and act like we love the Lord and act like that, that, that God is our focus, but sometimes our actions don't line up with what we're saying. Somebody say amen. Jesus stopped Judas. He said, I, I'm not going to let you kiss me when I know your heart. Are you here? True worship is only achieved when your heart learns to worship, not your mouth. Ah, you waiting on me to preach? I'm doing good already. When our heart worships and our mouth lines up with our heart. Somebody say amen. So Jesus stopped him and said, I'm not going to let you kiss me and betray me. Watch what happens. Verse, verse 49, when they, were, they which were about or around saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord, shall we smite? I love this. Jesus surrounded himself with a bunch of bullies. 
a bunch of fighters. Come on, somebody. I mean, John, John, James and John were called the sons of thunder. You know why? They got in a position one time and they begged Jesus, can we call down fire from heaven on these jokers? These were not sissy men. These were not passive men. Now they see Jesus, you know, all this troop coming at Jesus. 6,000, they were at, at maximum 11 of them, 12 counting Jesus, because Judas done betrayed them. Are you with me? And they were willing to take on 6,000 with their sword. Back at home, we would call these jokers rednecks. <laughs> I don't know what you'd call them here. And it has, it's not a racist statement in, in the South. You know, rednecks are just good old boys, just country boys, just, you know, willing to fight for what you stand for. Somebody say amen. We scared of a little old devil. We scared of a little old demon. When the Bible already says we can chase a thousand of them, why am I scared of one of them? A one of them should never move you. Stop giving praise to the enemy when he's defeated. Start giving praise to God because he's the victor. Somebody say amen. So at least not the mindset. These jokers are like, hey, they going to be a fight? Lord, let us go. We ready. We ready to take it down. Amen. I think the church has become too passive in our warfare. We run from the fight. We are to run to the fight. Somebody say amen. They said, let us just, 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 I can just see them. Please tell us. We ready. Let us pull our sword. We ready for a fight. Y'all see that? And one of them didn't even wait for the go command. We, we understand later it was Peter in one of the other writings. But he didn't, he didn't even ask. He just started cutting off ears. Somebody say, man, we need that kind of people. In now, I thank God for the Johns. You know, I thank God for the John the Beloved that just want to lay on Jesus all the time. Just like, but we need a rise of Peters and James and Johns who, who are willing to get off the lap of Jesus and take their sword and say, is there not a cause that we fight? Peter didn't even wait for Jesus to say yes. He said, bless God, I, I, listen, I'm just going to start cutting and ask for forgiveness later. Somebody say amen. He just, started, he just pulled that joker out. And watch this now. He cut the servant of the high priest. He cut his right ear off. Everybody see that? He cut his ear. Who was this guy? He was the servant of the high priest. That is important to know. Verse number 51. Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. What, what he said was, Can I heal him? Or permit me to heal him? That's what that statement literally means. Jesus said, Let, Don't, don't, don't. Now, you got to understand now, 6,000 troops. Do y'all mind if I come down there a little bit and get to 6,000 troops. You got to picture yourself here to really get the revelation. 6,000 troops, you got tension in the air, you got animosity in the air. At this time, the disciples now know that Judas is the betrayer. Just a couple of days ago, they didn't know who the betrayer was, right? They were sitting there with Jesus and they were saying, you, is he the one? You, you the one? You gonna do that? They didn't know who it was, but now they see the betrayer coming. Imagine how they're now feeling about Judas. There's a lot of anger in the air. There's a lot of, uh, of tension in the air. There's a lot of stuff going on. And right in the middle of all of it, now you've got a crisis situation because Peter, in his reaction, cuts the ear of a servant of the high priest. This wasn't just a foot soldier. This was a guardsman. Do you know what the punishment was if you put your hands on the soldiers of the high priest, corporal punishment, which mean death. Peter, because of his love for God and his protection for God, 
said, I'll receive a death sentence before I let you get to my Jesus. Now that's, that's honorable. That's honorable. But Jesus understood he needed Peter to still have influence on the earth. So in the midst of all this chaos, Jesus says, I got to calm this thing down. Can I heal him? What he was saying was, soldiers, don't, don't come after my boy. Watch the protection of your Savior. Watch the heart of your Savior. He's now got his son. I'm going to get you to hand this to me in a minute because I'm not finished. But He now has one of his sons, one of his disciples, that without... Without a trial. I mean, the dude's part of his ears laying on the ground. Do you understand? It's case closed. Peter is going to die for this. Instead of allowing them, 6,000 of them, to jump on Peter, Jesus steps in and goes, No, no, don't react. Let, let me fix this. Let me protect my son. Let me heal this man. You see the heart of the Lord? You got to see it because you got to understand that that's the reaction of your father. That when you make a mistake, when you react too early, when you do something that's not right, it's not lawful, God doesn't go, all right, devils, just get him. I told you if you failed that, that this was going to happen. I told you. No, God swoops in and goes, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me fix this thing. Do y'all see it? Do y'all see it? So Jesus said, let me fix it. Say, let me fix it. Do you have that up there? All right, Luke 22. He said, permit the, let me, let me fix this. And he touched the ear and he healed him. Does everybody see that? Let's just stop right there for the sake of time. Touched his ear and he healed him. Everybody see it? Watch this now. Why did Jesus heal this guy? That's what we've got to ask. Why did Jesus respond the way he did? Well, I gave you a little insight on the reason. But let me take it one step further. Peter, as I mentioned a while ago, just committed a corporate punishable crime. Without, it's the law of the land. And so what Jesus did, when Jesus reached down onto that ground, picked up that ear, or part of the ear, or whatever, I don't want to get, you know, in an argument here, if it was all the ear, a quarter of the ear, a scratch on the ear, doesn't matter. When Jesus took the ear and healed it do you know what Jesus just did Jesus just canceled all the evidence that the enemy had about what Peter did so here's what he did so when 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 they take Jesus because Jesus understood Peter is not going to be on trial here I'm going to be on trial Peter can't fulfill what I'm going to fulfill. I don't want anything to get in the way. Do you understand that? If they reached down and grabbed that ear, or if they went back to the high priest in the courtroom of, 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 the, of, of the church or the Roman government, and they went back and said, look at this cat's ear, or look at this cat's ear, who did this? He did it. Guess what happens? He now is going to die. Peter was not worthy to die in this trial. Only Jesus was. Do you understand? So Jesus, in healing the soldier, took all evidence away. Now all they got is their word. When they go back, think about it. When they go back to the trial, when they go back to the high priest, and they try to prove Peter's guilt... What's the high priest going to do? Where's the evidence? Well, I mean, I, I, I promise he did. Well, there's not even a scar. I mean, there's not even a scar on your ear. I 
understand 6,000 of you are trying to tell me what Peter did, but I need proof. Where is your evidence? We don't have any innocent. Isn't that beautiful? We think Jesus, we always, I've all, always heard it preached from the, from, the, from the view that Jesus loved his enemy so much that he still reached out and healed him. Well, maybe that's true as well. And it sounds real good in churches. But I don't think Jesus was as concerned with his enemy as he was his son. So you know what we do? We preach these messages. We teach these messages. And something in us says, well, that's wonderful for Peter. Thank God that God did that for Peter. But I can't really relate to Peter because I'm David. I'm Jim Bob. I'm Samantha. Peter was... 2,000 and something years ago, I'm dealing with 2,024. So, I showed you how God canceled all evidence against Peter. And we rejoice in that, but it doesn't really bring you victory. What if I could show you that Jesus did the same thing for you? That when your carnal mind and when your enemies... And when the people of your past try to bring up the times that you've cut ears off, that there's no evidence against you. I proved to you by the Word of God, God did it for Peter. What if I could prove that God did it for you? Would, would that give you some joy? Would that free you from religion? Would that free you from depression and anxiety? Would that free you from trying to live up to something that you're never going to be able to live up for? If I can show you in the Word, how many believe the Word of God's truth? How many believe that this is the infallible Word of the living God inspired by the presence of God? Do you believe it? So if I can show it to you in here, then you've got to make your mind line up with this. Is that right? So you made me that promise. Pastor, you showed me where Jesus healed ears for me. You showed me where Jesus canceled the, 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 the evidence against me. Well, I'm going to just show you. Bless God. You ready? Colossians chapter 2. <laughs> Woo-wee. This is going to be good right here. This is going to be good right here. I'm going to give you time to turn there. I know we're going to put it up on the screen, but I, that, that doesn't do, that's not exactly, I want you to see it in the book. I want you to see it in your Bible. Colossians chapter 2. Flip your Bible open, you'll probably hit Psalms. Take a right. You'll go to about Matthew, Mark, Luke. Keep heading right. You'll get to Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. You're almost there. You'll get to Colossians. It is in there, I promise. You ready? All right, when you're there, say amen. amen. If you're not, say hold on. All right, man, we're going to wait on you. We're going to wait. We ain't in no hurry. You got the miracle woman beside you, don't you? That's the miracle woman. What was your name? Sheila. Amen. The miracle woman. God touched her yesterday. Amen. At a men's conference. <laughs> now, religion and your carnal mind. Now, you understand that Paul teaches us that our carnal mind is the enemy of God. That your carnal mind is the enemy of God. Right? Paul said that it is not subject to the things of God, neither can it be. Which means my natural mind, my carnal mind, is the enemy of God. And God, I 
cannot, no matter how much Bible I read, now I renew my mind by the Word of God, but my carnality is never going to line up with God's purpose. It's not going to do it because it will always have a sin nature. So I can't speak to your mind today. i got to speak to your spirit. Do you understand? In your spirit is where victory is. Everybody got it? I preached to my church this past year on Resurrection Sunday. I preached to them about Jesus being placed in that tomb. And on the third day, everybody came to the tomb because that's the last place they saw his body. Right? They came to the tomb and the angel said, Why, who are you looking for? They said, well, we're looking for Jesus. And the angel said, he's not here. He has risen, which means he now sits above what killed him. I feel like I'm doing better than y'all letting on. He, he, he's, he's now above what put him in this tomb. He's now conquered it. And they even said, why are you, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And here's what I told my people. I showed them in the Bible, just like I'm about to show you, that all evidence against you has been eternally forgiven, cleared. The ear has been healed that you cut off. I'm about to show it to you. I had to show my people where the Bible says that when Christ was raised from the dead, that we were raised together with him. This is in Corinthians. We were raised together with him, and now we're seated at the right hand of the Heavenly Father with Christ. So what I told my people is now, if he rose again, and the angel said he's not in there, when your critics come at you trying to find that old man or that old woman, tell them, I'm not in there either. You can't let the world and your emotions and, and, and religion and everything else that is against you keep you in a tomb that God has already raised you up from. That old man's dead. Why would you come looking for the dead man among the living? Good God Almighty. Boy, that's good. I'm going to take up my own offering and I'm going to give to myself. I, I, I'm telling you. I'm doing good, ain't I, ma'am? What's your name, sweetheart? Judy, you're beautiful. I love you. Thank you for your support. She just smiling, boy. She getting it. Miss Judy getting it. She getting it, boy. I'm just going to preach to Miss Judy. You ready? All right, now you told me, Miss Judy, if I can show you in the Bible where Jesus healed, it, you know, theoretically, symbolically, that Jesus took all evidence that was against you and healed it, wiped it away, that, that you would believe it. You told me that. I saw you nod your head with your beautiful little smile. I saw it. Caught you out of corn my. Colossians 2, verse 8. And following. Be, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Uh-oh. This is gonna make this is gonna make religious people mad right here. Because Paul's telling the Colossians. Anyway, I'm gonna get out of that. Uh, don't let man spoil you through philosophy. And through vain deceit after the traditions of men. He's warning us about traditions of men. After the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. He said if they're not preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified, if that's what, not what your whole faith is built on, what He has done and what He did for you, don't listen to it. Right? For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are lacking in him. Oh, uh, uh, what? Now's the time for you to correct me, brother. What does it say? <laughs> Complete. Oh, so it don't say lacking. No. 
Are y'all awake? You, shut up. You are complete. I know he's tracking with me. That's why I point him out. He showed that to me yesterday. You ain't going to get nothing over on him. You are complete in him. You hear me? You are complete in him. You're not lacking anything. You're not waiting on God to do anything. You are complete in him. Watch this. This isn't even the good part. You are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So quit worrying about stupid devils. Are you here? We're not to be devil chasers. We're to be Jesus chasers. If a devil shows up, deal with it and keep on moving. It ain't no big thing. Amen? In whom, talk about Jesus, also you are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of sins by the flesh, by the, flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. Watch this now. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sin, convicted, tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. That was you. Is that right? Watch this now. Now you being dead in your sin and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him. Having forgiven you of your trespasses. Oh, that ain't it. Don't shout yet. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. Guess what that means? Legal documents. You know what it means in our message today? Evidence. I think it's make me happier than it makes you. Blotting out, and I know what I'm going to preach. <laughs> I already know, and I'm, it makes me excited. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinance, the evidence that was against you. Do you see that in your Bible? Which was contrary to us and took it out of the way and nailed When Jesus was cut on the cross, Isaiah told us what would happen. He said he'll be cut or wounded for your transgression. You know what that transgression is? Your evidence against you. He would be bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement of your peace would be placed on him. And by his stripes, you are healed. Colossians tell, tells us that when Jesus mounted the cross, because I'm closing right now. When Jesus mounted the cross, everybody was confused. And this is why Jews to this day don't receive Jesus as the Messiah. You know the number one reason? Because he died by crucifixion. And they say that the Son of God, the Messiah, would never die because that was corporal punishment for your worst sinners. And they're saying Messiah will never be a sinner. He will never sin. He will be perfect. Well, we know Jesus did. Well, why did he choose to mount a cross? He chose to mount a cross because when they nailed him to it, they were nailing your transgression, your evidence. <laughs> He was putting the ear back on the soldiers that he knew you would cut off. He was standing between 6,000 soldiers and your disobedience. So I rose today 
And I'm about to get on the plane in a little while. And I'm going to go see my beautiful wife and her two puppies. They're not mine because I'm a man. And them's little bitty old dogs. One's like a Maltese and one's a Cavapoo. Cavalier poodle. They little bitty old lap dogs is what the old folks used to call them. And men don't have them kind of dogs. So I don't care what you think. It's her dogs. But when I open that door, guess where they're going to be? Right there at daddy feet. But I can't tell y'all that because I'm a man, bless God. I got my, got my pride. But I'm going to get on a plane. And I'm going back home. I'm going back to my church. I've been home about five days in three and a half weeks. So I got about another week and a half where I'm going to be at home. I'm going to enjoy my life. I'm going to enjoy my kids. I'm going to enjoy my church. But God wouldn't let me leave without making one statement that I want you to live. Boy, I feel the Holy Spirit right now. That I want you to live the rest of your life by one statement. Every time those 6,000 soldiers come at you with evidence against you. Every time the enemy comes at you with evidence against you. Every time your carnal mind comes with evidence against you. Your family members come with evidence against you. Every time they come looking for that dead man, that dead woman, the one that is rightfully wrong. Every time they come, I want you to just make one statement. You ready for it? Yes. Prove it. <laughs> Prove it. When you wake up in the morning and you fail today and the enemy goes, Hey, you remember what you did yesterday? Prove it. <laughs> it stirs me up. Because you can't convict me with no proof. And the Bible says the moment I repent, that the evidence is cast as far as the east is from the west, drowning in the sea of forgetfulness. I don't fight with the devil. I don't fight with my critics. I don't try to justify the dis wrong decisions I make. I just look at them and go, Prove it. It ain't on me anymore. Because if you're going to come judge me, you're the one that's got to have the evidence to convict me. Because I'm innocent until proven guilty. If you don't have no evidence, prove it. When Jesus got up, I got up with him. And all the evidence against me has been nailed to the cross. All the years I cut off, Jesus healed them. So prove it. Well, that sounds awful cocky. Yes, it does. <laughs> and it sounds cocky, but it feels convincing. The enemy wants you to live in your past. He wants to keep bringing it up to you. But the fact of the matter is... In the spirit world, he has no evidence against you. What is the, what is the, stand to your feet, I'm done. I'm done. I feel it this morning. I just, just feel you tugging it out of me. So I'm trying to, I think it's around 1230, 1225, all right? Because I honor, I honor the house. Everywhere I go, you, you listen, God doesn't bless dishonor. He does not bless dishonor. And so... I honor the house. I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, I do. What does the Bible say that Lucifer is? He's the accuser of the brethren. That he goes to God to accuse you. But if he doesn't have proof, how can he accuse you? The moment you turn your heart to God and repent of a situation, the proof is, 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 is gone. It's like it never happened. The only way that the enemy can get proof on you is when you continue to bring it up. 
and you continue to live your life through the pain of which it caused. I can take somebody who's been addicted to heroin and they could be free for two years. But if they pull up their sleeves, the evidence of what they used to do will still be there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because I can see the scars from their pain. That's not who they are anymore. They don't do it anymore. But their body still echoes my pain. When God frees you, when it says, He who the Son makes free is free indeed. Now I know some translations say sets free. But if you look at the original text, makes free is the better translation. And I'm going to tell you why. If I got a bird cage right here, and I bring a, a bird and I put it in that cage, the bird's lifestyle is going to change according to its, its parameters. Even the growth of how big the bird gets will change according to the parameters. I can set that bird free, and that joker will be free, but I can recapture it and put it back in that cage. I set it free, but I still got the cage and I still have the accessibility to put it in there. Do you understand what I'm saying? It still has the remembrance of the confinement of the cage, even though I set it free. But to make something free, I'm letting you think about that one. To make it free, it has no confining remembrance of a cage. Because in its mind, I've made it free. So I took care of everything in the past that would bring it back to a cage. They don't even remember a cage. God don't set us free and keep the cage open. God makes us free so we don't even have the knowledge of what a cage is. Do you understand? So today, God wants to set people free, make people free. You're set free, but He wants to make you free. I want to pray for people. Number one, and this is going to be, do you need to say something? Okay. So this will be our dismissal and it will be our altar call. Sound good? So you can't get mad at me and say I didn't close at 1230. Because I'm dismissing at 1230. What time is it right now? You better tell me it's like till. Perfect. So this is going to be our dismissal and our altar call. If you're not born again and you're in this house, you're not promised tomorrow. A God that wants to make you free and heal the ears you've cut off in your life is standing here with open arms to receive you. Don't leave. If you're not 100% sure you're right with God, don't leave. Let's make it right. Let's make it sure. And if you would like prayer today, for God to make you free from the hurt and the pain that you've caused and maybe others have caused you in your past. I believe God's going to make some people free today. I believe He's going to make you free today. Amen. Can I tell you one little short story? This is the altar call. So I already closed. I'm done. But you're going to remember this. This has to do with your pastor's wife who's talking, telling jokes right now. With the... the now, this includes her. So, I grew up very, very, very rough, kind of like your, your pastor. I shared it with the men some yesterday. I write about it in one of my books called The Prodigal Father. 
uh, but very, very rough. And my whole life, the whole, my whole life, I could be preaching, and all of a sudden my mind would go back to some of these tragic events. And even to the point I could smell the smells. I could feel it. I'd be laying hands on people in Lagos, Nigeria, and all of a sudden, I'm just there. Tormented. Tormented. I talked about it at a pastor's conference, I think, a couple of years ago. And you actually come to me, and I think you want to do deliverance on me. She said, just pick it. But she asked me about deliverance and all this kind of stuff. And yeah, soul being restored and stuff like that. And, and so, anyways, about eight months ago, I'm preaching in Marion, Kentucky at Pastor Chris uh, McDonald's church. And we're coming for prayer. And there's five women, four women, praying before service. I mean, they're getting after it. And the Lord said, if you'll get those women to pray for you, I'll break the curse off your life. I knew exactly what he was talking about. It was the, that trauma. It was the cage. I said, all right. So I preach. I get done. I get real vulnerable with the people. I just open my coat and get vulnerable. And I tell them. And I said, but God told me if I get these four ladies to pray for me, God will break the curse. I'm telling you, I sat in a chair. They wept over me. They prayed over me. I think I fell out in the Spirit eight times in that chair. I mean, it was amazing. And I'm telling you, since that day, I've I have not dealt with that trauma. I haven't dealt with those... Because God made me free that moment. That, that moment. And God wants to do that for you. We have a prayer team, a prayer and altar team. To, to pray with them. Yeah, so, so prayer and altar team come. And this is going to be our dismissal and our, our altar call. If that's you, any of those that I've said, we want to pray for you. We believe God's going to touch you. And change your life today. Sound good? All right, so I'm going to pray, and you're going to be dismissed, and these altars are going to be open. If you need prayer, if you're not saved, if you're backslidden, if you're dealing with addiction, trauma of your past, please don't leave when the Spirit of God is here. I preach this message to set this up for you, an encounter with God. So don't leave. Amen? Father, we love you. We honor you. We bless you. We glorify your name. We thank you for your word. Hallelujah. Prove it. Glory to God. We thank you, Lord, that what you're going to do at these altars, Father God, is going to be life-changing. We open these altars, God, that the fire of God and the river of the Spirit of God will flow at these altars and through these prayer and altar workers. Change lives. Do what only you can do. I dismiss these people. I bless them. I speak the favor of God over them and I declare household salvation to their homes. No sickness or disease will touch their body and everything they touch shall be prosperous and blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Come and pray. No matter where you're at, Come and pray. Let him have his way, guys. I know the Lord spoke to you this morning. Just let him have his way.